the next speaker is, uh, I really don't even have an, I don't know how anybody can introduce this man. Uh, he's such a powerful force in the Hawaiian Islands, uh, Nainoa Thompson. We all know him because he is the first modern Hawaiian to practice the art of Polynesian navigating or wayfaring. He's currently on a worldwide voyage with the Hokalia called Malama Honua. And um, my understanding is that one of the primary purposes of this voyage is to promote sustainability and to connect cultures of the planet. And we're very honored to have him here today. And uh, thank you, Mainoa, for sharing with us. <laughs> Aloha mai kako. Uh, well, I'm honestly, I'm, I'm really intimidated in this room um, because, and thank you, Suzanne, for the confidence about, um, but the reality is that, you know, I'm not a scientist. I don't know much about sea level rising, um, but I am honored to be in this room today because of the work that you're going to do today that's important for all of us who really live in that dark place called ignorance, that, that know that things aren't right, the sail plan's the wrong direction, but we don't know what to do. And we don't know how to make decisions. We need this room to be successful at what it's being asked to do today. And so I'm honored to be here. and. Uh, Suzanne has been a long time friend. She's Keiki Ohaina, she's from this land. And the reason why she's such a great leader, because she's from here. And we're very, very lucky to have her at the Department of Land and Natural Resources. And uh, when she took that job, I was just like the happiest person in the state of Hawaii. And, um, and then I also want to, Uncle Les, thank you. I mean, you summed up the whole conference, everything come together, lift us, each other up, kokua, take care of each other, and then you'll make a better world. Very simple, very clear, very powerful. So you set the foundation for what we need to do as we come together with this diversity, because that's the only way. The, the only way is to bring the diversity of our whole state together to be able to solve these issues of a future that we can't even see. So honored. Um, I don't know what I can do for you today. I know Sam had asked me to talk a little bit about the worldwide voyage. <clears throat> um, and he said to be inspirational. Well, <laughs> I'll try my best. Um, I don't even know how to work this machine. But um, you know, I've been thinking about this conference and its importance. And, and um, this page. Okay. Oh, what happened here? OK. OK, yeah, page down. OK. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is just about um, about a friend, best friend, about an island, about a seed, and about a promise. And um, but before we start to go into anything about the worldwide voyage, um, I want to make sure that that if we talk about that voyage, we need to bring in the painter by the name of Herb Kawainui Kane, they're called an anthropologist in Santa Barbara in 1966 that dreamed about building a voyaging canoe. You need to talk about this man. Uh, when there were no Polynesian navigators left, we know extinction. We know what it smells like. We know what it feels like, because there's none of the great navigators. I mean, imagine you go back 2,000 years ago, and a voyaging canoe comes from a place called Kaikinui and lands in our shores the single most isolated high island archipelago on the planet. Uh, imagine that 2,000 years ago, that footprint on the sand would be, if we identify ourselves by who we are, by the place we come from, they would be Hawaiians. And they'd be the youngest culture on the earth, because the, the last place to be discovered. You can you imagine that we forgot all of that in that black room of ignorance uh, we lost all it. Imagine in public school systems by 1926, um, 
Hawaiian culture, language, genealogy was outlawed by policy. Imagine that private school teachers have the ability to beat their children and authority to beat their children if they spoke their first language. Imagine that. Then you had the painter, then you had the navigator, then you had the anthropologist, and you need to bring into this room the name of Aikau, Eddie Aikau, the most courageous person on the earth that I know that helps us find courage when we're most afraid. Believe me, we're afraid to sail Hokule around the world, but is it worth it? Is it worth the risk? Eddie helps with that. And then my dad, who was a social worker that recognized that Hokule needed to be needed to be successful. And the list goes on and on and on. And I know you have busy schedules. So I'm not going to take that much time. But the next teacher is vital to the seed of the worldwide voyage. And it came from the inspiration of an astronaut in Apollo 8. Uh, his name is Bill Ankers, who took this photograph. When uh, Apollo 8 was the first time that human beings left the gravitational pull of the Earth, went to the moon, went around the moon, and they took the first picture of the Earth shot, first Earth sunrise. And to some argue that that was the beginning of the environmental movement on the planet. When we saw the, the whole Earth as one island, and it's the only one we got, why mess with it? If it's all that we got, why don't you take care of it? Why don't we act? in a way of renewal when we are faced with the science today of what we're doing to destroy it. Um, and the person that was inspired, best friend, Kekioka Aina, Ku Aina, he's from this land, he fought for this land. Uh, he graduated from high school here, went into the Air Force, flew. He was a commander, he was uh, the lead pilot on the Thunderbirds, elite pilot. Uh, and then he was Hawaii's second astronaut into space. His name is Lieutenant Colonel Lacey Veach. Um, second astronaut after Ellison Onizuka to fly. Um, Keiki Okaina, he would be, in my humble opinion, the greatest explorer that would come out of Hawaii. Um, him and Ellison Onizuka. He would be in the shuttle program going around the Earth, the island, in the in 90 minutes. He was a scientist, mission specialist. Um, and he um, loved the canoes for what they stood for. I remember him coming on Hokulea for the first time and rubbing the how rails with his hand and saying, thank you, thank you for letting me be on Hokulea today because today I'll understand the power of what it is to explore. And uh, he Basically, long story short, <clears throat> smuggled that stone <laughs> into Colombia. And he flew and he said, hey, Nainoa, I'm going to bring you home a present from space. That ad comes from that island. On the, that's the Colombia window, edge of the earth on the top, and the island of Mokuokeave, Hawaii, where at that kind of red spot, on Mount Ukea is a place called Kianaka Koi at 12,500 foot elevation, sub-freezing temperatures every night, and the power and the strength of Native Hawaiians went up there because about 35,000 years ago, there, it, Mount Ukea was, was covered by a glacier, and there was an eruption. A super-cooled stone made it the best ads stone in the world, maybe second to the greenstone in New Zealand. But our people stayed up there in these freezing temperatures to get these tones, and Lacey was given this ads by his grandfather from Kiana Smuggles it on the shuttle, flies it in the window, and talks about the earth. And starts with, it's in trouble. I'm a scientist. And we need to find solutions. This slide, I put it up there, it's because it's reflective of the room. He said, we need to look 500 years backwards to find out how did the first peoples become sustainable? How did they do that? And then we need to use the power of technology and look 500 years forward 
and bring the things together, bring diversity together to find solutions, indigenous knowledge, power of science and technology. <clears throat> and he did this intentionally to make sure that this picture was focused on what you're going to do now. Take care of the dirt of your land, your home, the home of your children. <clears throat> He's a crazy guy. Um, we would get our calendar books that drive our lives, uh, and then we would cross off one date, and we would fly to Hilo, uh, meet him in Hilo, rent a car, drive it illegally up to less up to Poholoa, and then go up the black lava of Mauna Loa so that we could go to a place where the lava would absorb all light, and all you would see is the brilliance of the stars at 6,000 feet. And uh, we would spend one night camping up there and talking and dreaming about what are we going to do? What are we going to do? How are we going to connect the shuttle with Hokulea and help inspire children, not just to learn, but to get an education to change the world? And so we would be up there, and that one day out of the year, I just loved it, except for one thing. <clears throat> Lacey inevitably would go to status of the earth. How are we doing? 30 years of legitimate science, good peer-reviewed stuff, wrong sale plan, taking us to a place that's not going to work. And Lacey would go down that road, and I'll tell you, he is an intense guy. And, um, and he is the most optimistic person on the planet, except when he talked about the island <clears throat> and the sail plan that humanity is going on, it ends up at the place that we know. We're polluting it, we're changing it, we're making it worse, and now and now the science is getting much more clearer and more intense that it's more than we ever thought. This is 1992, the premonition of 1992. And he would talk, it's really us. He would talk about population. It took a million years to make a million human beings. Now we'll have, he said, by, by the middle of the century, we'll have nine billion. Now it'll work. And that's when Lacey loses it. I got to physically hold him and stop him from his rage about what we're doing to the earth. And because we had excuses in the past, we didn't know. But today we do. That's why this room's important. Today we know. He didn't tell me the story. His partner was named another astronaut by the name of Bill Shepard, who became the commander for the International Space Station in 2000 when it became first operational with two Soviet astronauts. He said, you know, Lacey, uh, they fly in the shuttle. They were mission specialists. One sleeps, one works, and they they, you don't have beds, but you have Velcro on the wall, and they stick you to the wall and put a mask on your face so you can sleep. Uh, and um, late, uh, Bill Shepard said he was looking at the inertial navigational system, and he could see that two things would rise soon. It would be the sunrise of the shuttle and the Hawaiian Islands. So he breaks protocol, goes over to Lacey, scrapes him off the wall, floats him to the cockpit window, takes his goggles off, wakes him up, and Lacey, that man of rage, looked outside the window and he saw in the golden light of dawn the Hawaiian Islands, his home. And Bill said, in the most quiet, calm voice, Lacey said, that's it. That's it. What we need to do is take care of our home. What we need to do is to do what this room's going to do. Make it the laboratory for the earth and make it for the school of, of the earth from what we learn. We need to move towards figuring out how we're going to be able to see tomorrow, how we're going to be able to adapt to it, how we're going to be able to live and thrive in that changing world and share it to the earth. Lacey said that was his vision, that we will build this, this is 92 now, we will build a laboratory for the earth. We'll create the school for the earth. And when we do that, we give it to the earth. And the best gift that we have is peace. That's Lacey. Lacey is the seed of the idea. He was the one that said, take Okulea around the world.
1992, take Hokulea around the world because Hokulea needs to learn from the earth and the earth needs to learn from Hokulea. Take it around the world. The astronauts saying, you need to go, Nainoa. And we didn't. Because when we conceptually thought about the idea about going around the world, we all agreed, great idea. Once we started to pull it apart and think about the risk, think about the cost, how dangerous this is going to be, it ended up into one of those constantly, we, we do too often, unrealistic dreams, and you don't go. You don't go. That was 1992. We lost Lacey, the lymphomelanoma, 95. You need him in this room. That's why I brought him. It took us 16 years to have the courage to go. Um, and, and, and part of the reasons why we decided to go was, was, was because you got to act. You know, the, we, we, as the science started to get more powerful and more intense and started to talk about the state, and, and the, what never changed was that kind of level of kind of public ignorance, that, that we knew things were wrong instinctually, but we didn't know what to do. So we don't do anything. It's like paralysis. So the leadership in the Voyaging community said, let's just go. It's somewhat blind, and yet the need to have to act, let's just go. And um, we trained for six years, and we departed in uh, May of 2014 around the earth. Um, it's an amazing place, by the way. Uh, we prepared Hokulea. Uh, we need she needed to be restored. We trained over 350 crew members. Um, we built another canoe called Hikianalia. Intentionally, Hikianalia would be our safety, our medical, our documentation, our education, and our science platform so that you can marry the traditions that Hokulea represented with science and technology. It's an equation, a simple equation, adding the two together as part of what we believe would be necessary for us to come together to make good decisions from what we learn. Um, that's the crazy sail plan that we put together. Uh, it had three things. Can you actually sail it? Can you keep it safe? And can you go to special places and meet special people to empower the mission of the voyage through education? And we made promises. One promise was an environmental one, Paiaina. We're bringing together many different stakeholders that looked at coming together and creating a sail plan. And it really was a promise to this, promise to children. We brought 47 educational leaders together to help us. If they didn't make the promise, we wouldn't go. And that would be university presidents, that would be superintendents, that would be uh, the presidents and the headmasters of, of our powerful private schools. So in, in essence, in the end, 92% of all K-12 students have access to the voyage, and about 82% about of all higher education have access to the voyage. It was crucial that we built the other voyaging canoe, that other education canoe, the one that, that drives our learning. And, um, and uh, that we are now, we did about two-thirds of the earth already since... Um, we left in 2014. We are in um, Natal, uh, Brazil, and ready to depart tomorrow for the Caribbean, to dive in Necker Island, to dive in Cuba, um, and take the voyage underwater. Snapshot about what we found. We found stuff like this. Yep. You know the story. We don't need to go into it. Uh, we're really messing things up. Um, and then we found, you know, places of light, places of hope, uh, extraordinary people. And even just, just in the educational side of these next slides, we went to Manaya Kalani in um, Aotearoa, 2,400 students from the poorest communities in Auckland came to chant Hokulea in a, play, in a school called Manaya Kalani. It's named after a Hawaiian star name for, the, for Maui, who had the hook. Kamakao Nui o Maui, to pull the islands out of the sea. And uh, it was a, a, a school that made sure that these poor children had a foundation of identity, that they had a sense of pride and dignity. 
so that they had a chance to even begin the, down the journey, the d rough journey of getting an education. And they married it with science and technology, amazing school. 2,400 were there at the beach. Then we went to Australia to the Reef Guardian schools where there are 310 um, schools that, that house the education from K-6. It's funded by the government to be able to essentially protect the Great Barrier Reef, the single biggest and oldest living system on the earth, ecological system on the earth, the Great Barrier Reef, and it's in trouble. I mean, the most magnificent reef in the world, and it's in trouble. So the government funds 310 schools, and they're targeting 127,000 students. When those little elementary school kids took us by the hand and walked us through where they were, had aquariums to grow corals and grow fish to restock, they took us into, into where they protect seabirds that are wounded. They took us into places that they're growing foods. They took us into, these are elementary school kids. And the primary reason is the earth's changing. There, are, there were more category five hurricanes in that coast in the last, last six years than there was in the last 120. And these children were amazing and they were, their job was if you protect life on the coral reef, you will build the economy. They're connected. <clears throat> Went to the green school, rated the number one um, environmental school in the planet uh, where they taught, teach sustainability. You know, what is that? And, 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 and what time period are you talking about? 100 years ago? 40 years ago? Today? What's it going to be like? What's the definition going to be like in 40 years from today if we don't do anything? And then we were in South Africa. Archbishop Desmond Tutu. If I ever start whining about the condition of my life, will somebody slap me? This man carried on his shoulders a lifetime of the pain and the sorrow of apartheid. He carried on his shoulders the pain and the sorrow of inequality. He carried on his shoulders the pain and the sorrow of poverty. Archbishop Desmond Tutu's scale division is to build 20 million desktops. Because we went to the schools that don't even have roofs. They don't even have chairs. They're doing their homework in the dirt. 20 million desktops so that they can put something on their laps so that they can write with a pencil, that they can help eradicate poverty through education. I was on here at the arrival of Hokulea. This man was frail. First public event he went into 2015. He was in this chair and it was hot, bundled up, and, and, um, and didn't want to speak. Uh, broken and uh, when Hokulea came in and you know what happened when Hokulea came in it wasn't Hokulea it was when the children from Hawaii from our from Kamehameha schools and from our charter schools came and danced with the African children this man got up and danced in the street danced in the street just got back from New York looking at a project called the billion oysters New York used to be the place that had the most amount of oysters, second in the world uh, in, in density. Uh, today, it's almost extinct. Uh, the Harbor School that is for poor kids that is in Governor's Island started a project called the Billion Oyster Project. And they did the math, they did the science. And they said that if we are able to regrow a billion oysters and put them back into the harbor, then what will happen is those oysters naturally will filter the whole New York Harbor in three days. And that what they have, they have over 50 schools involved now. They have uh, more than 60 restaurants in the New York area. 
the, the shells that they're now trucking to another state to dispose of really is the house. They are also told that, you, that the larvae of the oysters cannot survive the pollution, but when they made big homes and restored homes of oysters, they're finding that the filtering system allows for the larvae to survive. It's working. It's a school. But it involves everything, community, business, economy, uh, culture. It, it involves the, the issue of environmental restoration. It's an amazing project. <clears throat> and then we met extraordinary people. Um, Secretary General Moon from the United Nations sailed with us in Samoa, gave us that bottle, a promise of his membership to help protect the world's oceans. And then you had many other leaders that are coming forward. In the blackness of the darkness of fear and of ignorance, you have President Tong from the Kiribati that's, that basically rescinded Chinese um, permits to have uncontrolled fishing of their waters. You had President Remingasol that basically said, our fish are more our, our, our fish are more valuable alive than they are dead, and then put 25% into conservation. Extraordinary peoples in the, in the poorest of countries making extraordinary decisions. That's what we found. And we're going to go June 8th back to the um, to United Nations in New York and give the bottle back, because we have 40 declarations and pledges from around the world to give to Secretary Moon, so we can tell him we did our job. Yeah, Hokulea is, is doing what it's trying to do, and it's best that it can. Um, you know, Lacey, one of the questions I had when he was still alive, I said, Lacey, hey, if, you had, if the earth only had one seed, and that seed could grow life, and you only had one, where would you plant it? And without hesitation, he said, here. He said, here. He said, right here. He talked about the diversity of the only place on the planet that has all five climates. I mean, Suzanne, you know this way better than me. He talked about the, the, the most diverse, amazing ecological living system on the earth, the laboratory. He talked about this place being the islands. We need to think like islanders to think about the island Earth because we have no other place to go. He talked about Hubble and its ability to find the light 13 billion light years away. We're, we're like half a billion light years away from finding, and you can't find it by the way, uh, the, the Big Bang, but you can't find life. And so it's the only island we have. And he would put it here. And he would say because you can learn from the legacy of these ancient people that found sustainability 100%. 100% that nothing was brought in to Hawaii. We lived with what we had. And we had these amazing systems called the Ahupua system. We had these amazing systems that really were designed to protect water. The word vi is the definition of wealth. And we grew food. In that genius of protecting the water, the mountaintops, the watersheds, People weren't even allowed to go up there. That was wow, akua. It was for the gods. Protect the water. Protect your watersheds. Today, we, it's, like, it's the opposite. We're only 15% sustainable. And if you look where we live, we live everywhere. And when you look at the condition of our oceans, you know why. It's not the oceans, it's the land. You know this. You all know this. And then he talked about, you know, if you want to solve stuff like energy, we can do it. And then he would talk about, you know, and I know it, the problem is not tech, absence of technology. It's absence of culture. It's absence of people coming together, diverse, and not a culture that's defined by race. Not a culture that's defined and divided by geography, but a culture that's defined by core, good, goodness, human values that come together. This is the room. Uncle Les is correct. It's the room. It's today. That culture we're talking about, Lacey would say that Hawaii 
the child can still walk on the street. It's still safe. That, you, that, that over here, ethnicity is something that, that we embrace. That diversity is a value. He would talk about Hawaii. The most important value Hawaii has is that our culture here is still kind. And don't ever lose it. Don't ever lose it. Because if you have to work through the first problems to get to the other problems, if it's an issue of diverse, if it's an issue of equality, if it's an issue of poverty, if you have to break through that, then you're crippled. This is lacy. <coughs> then education, vital. One of the great problems today is ignorance. I'm gonna really embarrass her, I'm gonna make her stand up too. Uh, so sorry. Uh, she's 29, by the way, born in 1987 or something, and she's, uh, then Hokulea was lucky to find her when she was 16. And she's been in our voyaging programs for, I don't know, 13 years. Um, she's Keiki Okaina. She's born and raised in Kailua, uh, beautiful mom and dad. She's a uh, graduate of Kamehameha Schools, Olelo, Hawaii. She's grounded here. She knows who she is. She identifies that. And she's a PhD candidate doing her doctorate on sea level rising. Her and her Kumu, Chip Fletcher, are an amazing team that are doing so much for us. And then I, I you know, and she's a navigator. I sailed in 1980. Ma was even on board from Hawaii to Tahiti. It took me 31 days. She sailed in 2014 to Tahiti with six other people, students that are, that are in their 20s, and they found Tahiti in 16. Um, she's probably our most valuable player on the voyaging canoe today uh, because of who she is, what she stands for, and more importantly, what she's going to do. Hamdani Kani, will you please stand up? The last thing I'll tell you about what we found in the worldwide voyage. Hanging around primarily Pacific people, even in the Indian Ocean. Um, people are really afraid. People on the earth are afraid because we're not in control. And it's not about ignorance, because you know they actually, it's, it's, it's reverse. It's because we're learning how bad the ocean issues are and that the ocean is the engine of life. And you add up all these stressors, sea level rising, raising the th thermostat, acidification, coral bleaching, uh, epoxy, dead zones. I mean, name it all. We, we start to do the measurements on these specific problems, but what we don't do is, what we don't understand is the multiple stressors. When you add it all up, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen to wildlife. We don't know what's going to happen to the chemistry of the sea. We don't know what's going to happen to the actual chemistry of the air. Because the next three breaths you take, thank plankton in the oceans for giving it to you. It's a blue planet. There's fear around the world because we're becoming educated and we don't have the sail plan. We don't know. We know that the one we're on is not going to work, but we don't have the new one. That's why I keep going back to the room and how important your work is today, from my humble opinion. I know fear. My two little ones, my twins, were born on November 22, 2008. There was an older Portuguese lady, our pediatrician said, these are keepers. You don't need to go to that special room for twins because they're really healthy. You can go, mom, you can get your own private room and take your children with you, dad, you can hang out. There was an old Portuguese lady that came in the next morning, that was a Saturday, and walked around, looked at my son and kept telling me, hey, you know your son, your boy, something wrong with him. This is probably the least educated of all the nurses, because they're basically cleaning a room in the morning. 
It wasn't the ones that were there watching the monitors all night long. It was the one that, that's instinctual, that understands, that knows, goes around the room, cleans the, the, the rubbish can, comes back to me and goes, something wrong with your boy. I'm a brand new dad. I don't know anything. Does he have a cough? Does he, is he sneezing? Leaves the room, but that lady, when my pediatrician left that Saturday night, brand new and didn't know my kids, went to the pediatrician and said, something's wrong with his boy. I never ever saw that lady again, like a miracle. That pediatrician came and said, we want to get put an x-ray. Puts him in an x-ray, finds nothing wrong. Then she said, we want to put a dye in and do an x-ray. And then, I know fear. About 5.30 p.m., a lady comes in, I don't know who she is, a nurse says, sign this form. It's a form for me to allow my child to be operated on in an emergency. And I tell her, I'm not signing this. What is it about? She said, you better sign it, because if you don't, your son's going to die. I know fear. Long story short, my son was in an operation, emergency, 32, 32 hours old. Surgeon comes in at 9 o'clock and says, that's the sickest boy in the state of Hawaii. I give him 50-50. And then he said, I'm going to need to go back in on Wednesday because he's going to have infection. No infection on Wednesday, Les. Didn't go in. Went back in on Friday says, I have got to go in. Back in. Goes back in and says, after that Friday operation, says, he's going to probably live. But he'll never, ever live a healthy life because we cut up too much of his stuff inside of him. The third surgery, they go back in and they say, had to go and redo things, I'm not gonna get too deep into it, and said, yep, your son will never ever be able to have a healthy life because he's never gonna be able to process food enough for him to be, to, to be healthy. And then the fourth surgery, Kathy, my wife, and I are in, are in the chapel and we get a phone call on our cell phone, and it's, a, it's an anesthesiologist that holds the phone, and the surgery unit's all cheering. That my son was supposed to lose 12 centimeters of his intestines actually grew back more than six centimeters. So I go rushing down to the recovery room get inside there, I ask the surgeon, how do you explain that? He takes off his gloves, throws it on the table, says, I don't know, I think it's a miracle, walks outside, almost kind of angry, because it wasn't him. And then we go through all these things about, then another guy comes in who's a neurosurgeon and says, um, your son has this problem of always turning to the left and looking up in this plastic box of five months in the, near, in the, in the NICU keeps looking up. We think he's got brain damage. We want to put dye in his brain. And I tell him, no, you're not. My son does not have brain damage. And he ain't doing that. And then the nurse came to me and said, thank you, Nino. Thank you for making a decision on something you don't know about. Your son does not have brain damage. He said, your son, and this is a longtime nurse in the NICU, said, your son is looking at an angel that there's an angel in the room, it's in the corner, and he keeps turning. That's my father. It's the kind of miracles that we don't always calculate. It's the kinds of things that we don't fully understand. But there's a nurse that trusts, that trusts that there's someone protecting this boy in the plastic box, that never seen a sunrise, never touched a blade of grass, doesn't know what the wind feels like. All he hears is the sirens of emergencies of all the other 60 children, 100 children that are in that room. That's all he sees. He is afraid because you can't hold him. So Sunday night, when I was flying out, he made me stay home. I was supposed to go to Kona on Sunday. He made me stay home. And in the bed, trying to put these two asleep, because my wife works at night on the weekends, we talked about fear. He says, Dad, Stay with me tonight. I don't want you to go away. That's because I was going to go on a plane. And then we talked about this issue of fear. We talked about 
the time that he was in the hospital in the box. <clears throat> and we talked about angels. I said, you know, the nurse told me, now, you know, there was an angel in the room that was protecting you. And that angel stayed with you the whole way. And that's your grandfather. Then his twin sister, Puana, turns to me and said, do I have an angel? And ho, I backed out. And I said, Puana, you have many angels. And it is your grandfather. It's Stella Kutaka, my assistant. It's many of those that came before you, and it's many of those in your family now. There are angels that's going to take care of you. When these two children, after we talked about that, they fell asleep within two minutes next to each other. I got up, walked out the room, and th thinking, if a father cannot protect the lives and the future of the children, that father can't do anything. So when I look at the angels, I'll leave you with one thing. I say this with humility, but I say this with honesty, I say it with truth. This room is the angels. What you're about to do is come together. <coughs> Diversity. You don't know each other in here. But you have one thing in common, that you believe that you have something to give collectively. By yourself, maybe it's not that much. But collectively, you can make change. The assessment that you're going to come up with is you're like cartographers for tomorrow. You're going to give it to leaders. You're going to give them you're going to give them intelligence. You're going to give them information. You're going to give them the best shot at the sale plan. So you're, you're creating a map of tomorrow that nobody else can see, but you'll see it this afternoon. You, to me, to me, I need you for me to really believe that when I tell my children that there are angels out there, it is also you that are going to help us not only be protecting our shorelines, but you're going to be protecting our home for our children tomorrow. So please, please understand that I'm extraordinarily grateful and thankful for all of you being here today and helping us with the map on behalf of my children. Thank you.